In this place, the cabinet war rooms preserved deep under London, decisions and plans were made which saved Britain during the Second World War. As a consequence, the man who made those decisions, Winston Churchill, has been acclaimed as the greatest Englishman. But Churchill himself had one answer to that. The greatest Englishman was Alfred the Great. chosen to tell the story of Alfred's wars with the Vikings from Churchill's war room to convey the sense of great events. Because Alfred and the Vikings, like Churchill and the Battle of Britain, or Elizabeth and the Armada, is one of the great folk myths of the English-speaking peoples. It's something we're brought up with from childhood. And Alfred's story, more than any other, is the story of how somebody uh, with great willpower overcame tremendous difficulties while everything around seemed to be falling apart. This remarkable room will also remind us how war is won by communication as much as by fighting. And communication, getting your will done, was the key to ninth century kingship. On that, your success or failure rested. In the ninth century, that success or failure was measured against the Vikings. The Viking assault on Western Europe was a blitzkrieg of a permanent kind. After it, there could be no return to the old order. In Britain, they destroyed the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. And for the kings themselves, a peculiar and terrible end was reserved. In 867, the king of Northumbria was the first to suffer the blood eagle, a Viking sacrifice to Odin, where the ribs and lungs are cut out of the living victim and spread like eagle's wings. The young king of the East Angles soon followed in 869, and in 874, the king of Mercia, Burgred, abdicated and fled to Rome, leaving Wessex alone. These events determined the course of Alfred's life. He was born in 849, youngest son of the king of Wessex. He had little prospect of becoming king himself until fate took a hand. In the winter of 870, the Vikings began their attack on Wessex. In the next year, nine battles were fought. On January the 8th, they marched part of their army up the Great Ridgeway, the prehistoric route which cuts across England into the heart of Wessex, a track used by travelers, traders, and armies for thousands of years, the most historic of all hikers' paths. There, on the top of the Berkshire Downs, the ridgeway passes by the ramparts of an Iron Age hill fort, which commands wide vistas into Wessex. Under it, centuries before, a white horse had been cut through the turf into the chalk. A landmark everyone knew, near the junction of old roads, and perhaps to the Vikings, a place with magic associations. A horse of Odin? Here, on Ashdown, as it was called, the Vikings found the ridgeway blocked by the West Saxon army under King Ethelred and his young brother Alfred. The battle was won by Alfred's hot-headed impetus, charging up these hills like a wild boar, as a contemporary said. The Vikings fled till nightfall, leaving one of their kings and five leaders dead and the whole breadth of Ashdown covered with bodies. The victory on Ashdown proved illusory. Within months, the English had lost the upper hand. Defeated in further battles, King Ethelred died, and the West Saxons had no choice but to look over his sons to the one man who had proved his arm in battle. At 21, Alfred became king. His biographer, Bishop Asser, paints him as a strong-minded but intense and highly strung young man, a constant sufferer from some sort of nervous illness, an unlikely king, in fact. 
His start was not auspicious. Massively reinforced, the Danes beat him too, but they accepted his offer to buy them off. They turned to easier pickings, but they and he knew they would be back. The years after Ashdown must have been something of a phony war for the West Saxons, because the main weight of the Viking attacks now fell on the old kingdoms of Northumbria and Mercia, which they divided out and settled, setting up puppet kings who would do as they're told and pay tribute. It all serves to remind us how difficult the old kingdoms of the West found, found it to cope with the Vikings, their fast mobile armies, their ability to shift their attack from one point to another, not merely within a kingdom, but from the continent to Britain and back. In 875, the main Viking armies split up, going to Northumbria and to a base at Cambridge. The leader of this great army that settled on Cambridge was Guthrum, and he is to be the other protagonist of our story. As it turned out, Guthrum's move to Cambridge was the prelude to the Danish attempt to defeat and dismember Wessex once and for all. Southampton, Alfred's biggest and most important port, had been the most successful town in Dark Age Britain. But in Alfred's reign, its commercial life was strangled and the site abandoned. The long-term pressures that the Viking invasions put on a king could hardly be more vividly demonstrated. Archaeologists here are now excavating the Anglo-Saxon port Alfred New, a densely populated town with a planned street grid, organised housing plots and a wealthy luxury import trade on a scale unmatched in Britain. All the product of royal direction. Phil Holdsworth is now finding clear evidence for settled town life here. The road surfaces were even metalled and recent finds prove that in Alfred's time there had been a long-established economy using money, the strongest indication of the town's wealth and status on the eve of its destruction. In the 8th century, until King Offa introduced the penny, it was this type of coin which was in circulation. We call this a shutter or a proto-penny. They're tiny, aren't they? This one here was probably minted in the Saxon town, and the one you are holding came from Mercia. This is one of the English pennies. This is a coin of Kerwulf, who reigned at the beginning of the 820s. And these would be in fairly general circulation, would they? Yes, and I think as we find coins from all over uh, England, from the other English kingdoms, and from the continent, it tells us how important money was to the economic system. It also suggests this place was particularly important within the country, doesn't it? Oh, it certainly does. It, it was, without doubt, the economic hub of Wessex for over 150 years. What happened to it in the Viking era, then? What difference did the Viking raids mean to this wealthy commercial life here? In 840 and again in 842, the town was raided by the Vikings. We are told that the elder man wolf here had repulsed something like 50 Viking ships on the second occasion. But uh, the town was burnt down. I don't think it was so much the physical destruction of the town itself that mattered all that much. Knock out one link in the trading network and the merchants will go somewhere else. No, I think it is more the disruption of the trading pattern itself. When the Vikings began to attack the ships in mid-channel, then the merchants would no longer set out with their goods. If the merchants were not coming to the English ports, the raison de terre for them had disappeared. And so the resident population had to move out and find something else to do instead. And indeed, we can relate the collapse and abandonment of Hamwe to the general collapse of the European economic system during the 9th century. The place was rebuilt in the early 10th century on a new site where the later town grew up. But it didn't recover its status as an international port until the 12th century. In 876, if there was anything left of the settlement, Guthrum will have sacked it. But he moved on to Wareham on the south coast, where he took winter quarters inside Wessex, right under Alfred's nose. A deadly game of cat and mouse had begun. Alfred must have thought that the pincers were beginning to close in on him now. The Viking army from Wareham moved across to Exeter, avoiding battle with him, and then took up winter quarters all the way up in Mercia at Gloucester. 
That's the winter of 877. And at this point, Guthrum's plan starts to be revealed, for another Viking army takes up winter quarters just across the Bristol Channel, opposite Devon, ready to take Alfred from both sides. The time, therefore, had come for a concerted attempt to conquer Wessex as a whole. Christmas passed, and then Guthrum and his chiefs in the Royal Hall in Gloucester made their decision. They launched a lightning attack southwards and seized Chippenham. Why Chippenham? Well, the date gives it away, Twelfth Night. They attacked on a major Christian festival. Now, there'd be no point in that kind of planning unless there was somebody important here. And that important person surely was King Alfred. Alfred, perhaps, was passing the Festival of Epiphany here, and Guthrum's intelligence was good enough to know that he was here and to try and take him alive when he was off guard. That's conjecture, but we do know that Chippenham was a favoured residence of the West Saxon royal family. Alfred owned this estate, his son and his grandson held court here, perhaps where late Saxon timber buildings have been found up there. And Alfred's oldest sister was married to Burgred, King of Mercia, in the royal church which stood on this site. So we're talking about a major royal centre, and also a defended one. The River Avon makes a great sweep round the town at this point, but even on the river sides there seem to have been defences. A ditch has been discovered on the west. On the open southern side there was probably a ditch and palisade with a gate blocking off the peninsula. And here on the east too, there may have been a defensive work along the line of this raised platform of the church, sufficient to withstand a two-week siege, which we know it later did. Guthrum must also have chosen Chippenham because he knew that the area around it had not been devastated. You don't go careering off in midwinter to somewhere where there are no supplies, and he and his chiefs had been in the game long enough to know that if the king was here or expected here, then his assessors would have gone before and laid in a food dump for the winter with salted meat and fish, uh, bread and honey, eels and ale, everything a Viking needs for a happy new year. So they had their secure base, and from here they prepared to make their strikes deep into the heartland of Wessex. Alfred had temporarily slipped through their grasp, but Guthrum had every reason to be pleased. Surely it would not be long now before the West Saxon king too suffered the dreadful rites of the Blood Eagle. <coughs> West Somerset. In the spring of 878, these marshes were the last refuge of the West Saxon royal house. Even in 1979, torrential rains broke banks, flooded fields, and blocked roads. In his darkest hour, Alfred took to the marshes. With a small band of friends, family and retainers, he journeyed in great tribulation through the woods and into the inaccessible areas, the moor fastnesses of Somerset. Denied his supplies, he was forced to make sallies against the Danes and against those of his own people who had submitted to the invaders. And it's at this nadir of his career that we get the story of him hiding in a cowherd's hovel and burning the cakes. But after 11 weeks of hit and run and roughing it in the swamp comes the turning point. He and his followers build a small fortification in a remote part of the Parrot Marshes here, a place deservedly hallowed in the island story called Athelney. The place was described as surrounded by reeds and thickets, abounding with wild birds and marsh creatures, approachable only by punts. The land is drained now, a low hill flattened by the building of Alfred's church on top, where the monument now stands. In his time it changed from swamp to lagoon according to the rains and tides, making it difficult to approach by sea or land. It can still be boggy today. Dr. David Hill of Manchester University has identified many of the lost sites of Alfred's forts. 
David, why did Alfred come to Athelney? Well, well Athelney, the, you know, the island of the princes, is obviously an area he'd hunted over. He'd grown up here, you see, what, a few miles north at Cheddar. The royal family had hunted through all these marshes. He'd been, you know, he'd hawked for the herons, he'd come after the swans, he'd chased the deer. So he knew every trackway, he knew all the villagers, he knew everybody who fouled in the marshes. Uh, here, here was a place where, he, if anywhere, he was safe. Not only because it was so difficult to get to, but it was because he had this intimate knowledge of the countryside. And Athelney itself, of course, is, is an island. You can't get at it, and the Danes couldn't get at it. And what kind of fortification would he have built here? How, how should we imagine that? Well, I personally think that there must have been something on that hill. But if he built the church on this hill, then perhaps his first fortification is on here. But when we say fortification, I should have thought he'd got his, his house carls with him, just a, a very few people. So, a couple of hundred feet across, a few, a few huts against the inside, the whole thing a rough wooden stockade with a ditch and the earth thrown behind the stockade. Very much a, a quick piece of work, not of the style that you'll see at Wareham, you see, with those great banks. This would have been perhaps no more than, say, 20 feet from the bottom of the ditch to the top of the stockade. Very much an emergency burn, a sort of good work. So the cake story doesn't really tell the tale of Athelney? Oh, I don't know. There's, like a lot of fable, it's got an element of truth. He was down on his luck. I don't suppose, in fact, when he was here, he was on his own. I should imagine he was here with, with 100, 200 people. But uh, he was right down on his luck. He was the last remnant of England. In fact, if he'd given up, like Burgred, you see, he'd run, run overseas, well, I suppose we'd be talking in Icelandic and saying, you know, that he'd run away and, you know, it was a good thing and you and I'd have fairer hair than we've got now. In these fields, in 1693, a jewel was picked up by a farm labourer. It is set in gold, and the inscription round the edge reads, Alfred mech het gewirkan. Alfred ordered me to be made. Meanwhile, Guthrum had driven a knife into the heart of Wessex. In Hampshire, people fled over to the Isle of Wight. In Wiltshire, at least one earl deserted the king and fled abroad. In Dorset, it may be that the Vikings approached other branches of the royal family, just as the Nazis had the Duke of Windsor in Paris, in the hope of setting up a puppet government after Alfred's death. Everywhere, men submitted to them, but some remained loyal. From his war room on Athenry, Alfred managed to organize the resistance movements for a final throw, a surprise attack on Guthrum. Alfred's eventual counterattack was something of a Dark Age D-Day, and it's a great pity that we don't know more about the West Saxon underground movements, because there must have been something like that to enable Alfred and Alderman Athelnoth of Somerset to keep in contact with their allies in Wiltshire and Hampshire. Alfred had decided to risk all on a pitched battle with Guthrum, and the messages were sent out to the local leaders to gather their forces and meet him. The time was in the seventh week after Easter, which suggests that the rendezvous day would be Whit Sunday, the 11th of May, and the place was Egbert's Stone. Everybody knew it, we don't. It was near Pencilwood, but that's all we know. And there, the men of Somerset, Wiltshire, and part of Hampshire met their king. And, says the Chronicle, they were overjoyed to see him. The next day, Monday the 12th, if our guess is right, they moved on to Eiley Oak, near the residence at Warminster, but off the main road. By now, secrecy and speed were all that counted. That night, they prepared for battle. The next day, at the first glimmer of dawn, they pushed on up the old track onto Salisbury Plain. Guthrum was camped north of the plain with his whole army, coincidentally or not, close to another ancient white horse, as at Ashdown. The place had not been chosen by chance. Alfred had an estate and a hall here. Perhaps it was a favorite of his. He left it in his will to his wife. He must have hunted here, and he will have known all the tracks like the back of his hand, especially the one which goes over the top and down onto Eddington.
Here, in the words of Alfred's biographer, he launched a ferocious attack on the whole pagan army and by God's will eventually won the victory, making great slaughter among them and he pursued them to their fortress, Chippenham. Everything left outside, men, horses and cattle, he seized and he killed all the men and he camped outside the gates. After a fortnight, the pagans were brought to the extreme depths of despair by hunger, cold and fear and they sought peace. Three weeks later, Guthrum came with 30 of his leading men here to the marshy island called Alla, where Alfred stood godfather to him and received him from the font. Alla was the closest church to Athelney, and it may have been here that Alfred had prayed for victory in his darkest hour. Here, Guthrum and his men put on white baptismal robes and waited with linen crosses bound round their foreheads to keep in the holy oil, holding lighted tapers. Did they snigger at it all? Did Guthrum give his chiefs a wink when he stepped out of the font? It's possible. The Vikings have been in tight corners before and sworn anything to get out of them. But this time was different. Whether it was the Christian magic or Alfred's, they kept their oaths. Alfred's luck had proved the stronger. A week later, the ceremonies finished at Wedmore, a royal church and hunting estate near Cheddar. Here, Guthrum and his leaders stayed for 12 days and were honored by Alfred with feasting and gifts. For all his conventional piety, Alfred spoke to the Vikings in their language. He was what they expected a great king to be. A hard man, a battle winner, a king with luck. And yet generous both to his own followers and to those enemies who acknowledged him. Nobody respected a weak king in the Dark Ages. And in these extraordinary events at Aller and Wedmore, he had not acted out of weakness. For him, it had been a choice between the cross and the blood eagle. Later that year, Guthrum and his army left Chippenham and Wessex for good. They moved to East Anglia, divided up the land and settled there, their descendants becoming part of the English nation of Alfred's grandchildren. The climactic of Alfred's wars had passed. There would be much more fighting during his life, but at this point, with the salvation of Wessex behind him, and still only 29 and yet a hard-bitten and experienced king, he could, for the first time, look to the future. Winning a war is one thing, but constructively using the peace is quite a different matter. And it's Alfred's revolutionary achievements there that raise him to the ranks of true greatness. His first revolution was a practical one. He constructed a network of fortified towns and strong points throughout Wessex, so that in future, whenever the longships on a Viking raid snaked their way up the English rivers, like this one, the Froom in Dorset, to strike into the English heartland, they met not merely defenceless nunneries and unprotected trading stations, but fortified towns. And we're sailing into one now.
This is the West Saxon Bourg of Wareham, perhaps the best preserved Anglo-Saxon town in the country. It lies between the Froome here and the Trent in the finest natural position you could hope to find, as Bishop Asser said. The Anglo-Saxon jetty was where it is now on the south, and the other three sides still have their massive Anglo-Saxon defences. These banks were actually put back into action as anti-tank ditches in 1940. And on the north side, where the houses peep over the top of the defences, the modern road follows the line of the original causeway across the marsh. Wareham's regularly laid out town plan goes back to the social engineering undertaken by Alfred and his successors, and can still be seen simply by standing at the main crossroads. At the northern gate, this Saxon church was part of the defences, a stone bastion to bolster the palisaded entrance, and the finest surviving example of a small town church. Inside, you're back in the Dark Ages. Near the quay is the once magnificent church of St. Mary, whose tower is a landmark when you come in by water. Inside, one of Alfred's predecessors was buried, and in its shadow in the Priory grounds, a Benedictine nunnery destroyed by the Vikings was rebuilt by Alfred's daughter. David Hinton of Southampton University has excavated extensively in Wareham and is putting together a picture of an upsurge in urban life in the years after Alfred inaugurated his burgle system. It was a mint during Athelstan's reign in the early 10th century. It's recorded in document as that. Um, our excavations showed also that there was a population beginning to develop, even quite a long way away from what would have been the focal point of the town, right in the centre where the streets cross. And clearly that's going to be the key market area, that and this area where we are now near the river crossing. So the very fact that there's 10th century occupation quite a long way away from the centre is significant of quite a large population beginning to use where you'd have one or two of the top specialists, the coiners, the minters. There would have been other sorts of merchants. There would have been artisans, there would have been people serving the local community generally, bone workers, that sort of thing, making tools. The burgle system, I think, to those who are not familiar with uh, the kind of power that the Anglo-Saxon kings had, must be very impressive. How do you view the power that enables them to do planning on this scale? Um, viewed as a whole, when you know that this is just one of a whole chain of forts, then clearly gives one a different idea of the way in which they could organize their kingdoms. Um, and clearly they had very considerable powers, which we only get hints of from such documents as the laws. Um, but the coinage points very much to the same thing. You can see the same sort of governmental control tightening on the coinage. Um, so I think the archaeology goes with the documents in helping one to see just what the royal authority could achieve. In Winchester, Alfred's statue stands in the popular eye as a monument to the capital of Wessex. And although the notion of a capital city in the 9th century is anachronistic, the archaeological digs here have uncovered street planning on a huge scale, the deliberate development of Alfred's reign. And here, in the Cathedral Close, was the greatest collection of Anglo-Saxon royal buildings yet known. The Old Minster, the Royal Family's Church, Alfred's Royal Palace, and the churches built by his wife and his son. This coin was minted by Alfred in London to commemorate his conquest of the city in 886 after a violent struggle with the Vikings. Within three years, he had repaired its walls, repopulated the city, and given the settlers regular plots of land bounded by new streets, inaugurating the street plan we know today. The city was still a great commercial centre for Western Europe, and fittingly, Alfred's coin celebrates the conquest almost in terms of a Roman triumph. But if you wish to see today traces of Alfred's own hand in the founding of towns and forts, you must go not to the big cities, but back to his Somerset heartland. Here at Ling, Alfred built a fort near his church at Athelney, the thank offering for his victory. And here David Hill has discovered his defences in the orchard by the church. He decided to make England 
stable by having a sort of hedgehog principle. There was always a solid basis so that people just didn't keep running away. And in places like this, he built refuges for the people at large. In this place here, we know more about this than practically any of these small places because of the documentary evidence. And that documentary evidence is the life of Alfred the Great by a Bishop Asser, which tells you that he built to the west of his monastery at Athelney, and we are to the west, a, uh, a fortification of marvelous workmanship connected to another fortification by a causeway. And here you would expect the ditch, a major ditch through. Behind. This is it, is it? We're in it. Oh, we're standing in the ditch now. Uh, or rather, on the fill of the ditch, it's probably another 16 feet under here. It's very soft. Uh, and behind you see this major bank. And on top of the bank, palisade set in, timber strapping through the bank. And there, to give strength to the whole structure, uh, the church. The it's church just, will be part of the defences. Oh, very much so. As you see at Wareham, you see that you've got this church sitting on the bank. Uh, it, it, it forms a strong point. It gives you uh, two for the price of one. You build a church, but you also have got a, a, a nice commanding strength at the top there. Why did he want to defend Ling? It's not a very important site, is it? Well, if you're going to build a thank offering to God for your great deliverance, you don't then want, having shown that you're very grateful to God for delivering you from the Danes, put it in a field and wait for the day to come and burn it down again. So he wanted to protect it. But on the other hand, he, again, two for the price of one, uh, he builds it, protects it with this thing, but instead of making it just a, a bridgehead, he makes it 11 acres. Uh, and then all of the people from West Somerset, between here and halfway to watch it, you see, which is an expert in that direction, come here when, when the beacons are lit. Up go the beacons all the way along the Quantus, because the Danes are coming up, up the Severn. They all run here as fast as they can down the Heropath. They come pounding into here, they slam the gate. There are a hundred men to protect them already, waiting in here. The Danes can't find anything then that they can take away with them. I mean, they can have haystacks if they want them, but it's very difficult to get a haystack back to Denmark. <laughs> Learning is power. The search for Alfred's second revolution brings us to the Bodleian Library in Oxford. The educational system in Anglo-Saxon England, which was founded on the great monasteries, completely collapsed during the Viking invasions. Alfred himself says that when he came to the throne, he knew of very few people in Northumbria, the great ancient centre of learning, who could still understand their church lessons or even translate a letter from Latin into English. And Latin, remember, was the instrument of government and of literate culture. He goes on to say that he knew nobody in his own kingdom who could do that simple task. His plan to restore literacy and learning in England was in its basics, very simple. He and his advisers chose a handful of books which they felt it was most needful for men to know. They translated them into English, they had copies made, and these were sent out to the various bishoprics. The books were books of history, philosophy, and morals. They included Bede's History of the English and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which was the story of Alfred's own dynasty and their unbroken success story which had led up to the Battle of Eddington. And this book here is one of them. It's a contemporary copy of Alfred's translation of the pastoral care of Pope Gregory the Great, a handbook for bishops and their duties, although Alfred seems to have seen those duties in a, in a wider perspective. For him, perhaps, the jobs of kings and bishops weren't that uh, different. This was the copy that was sent out to Worcester, and it carries Alfred's greetings to the bishop Wherefare for the top, his wardum lovelicher and friendlicher in a friendly and, and loving way. The manuscript here was written under Alfred's supervision, probably in the scriptorium at Winchester. And with this book, we're really right with Alfred. We're looking over his shoulder. So the, one can imagine a sort of seminar. They sat round, read the Latin text out, perhaps, worked out an English version between them, which a secretary noted down, perhaps in shorthand, to give to the scribe. Here, in Alfred's own words, is a preface which describes how he undertook that great task, how he began amid the 
various trials and uh, tribulations of the kingdom, on gemang othrum mislicium and manifieldum viscum visus cunariches, to put the book into English, the book when done on English, the book called the Herder book, Pastoralis. Why do it? Why did a middle-aged man who had acquired literacy only at the age of 40 go to all this trouble while the Vikings were burning things down around him? There was undoubtedly a moral reason. Uh, the church had acquired considerable influence over the forms of kingship by that time, and it was held paradoxically that a king who upheld peace and morals at home would prosper in warfare and expand his territories. But there's more to it than that. If you were a king, uh, and all you needed to do was to rally a tribe, then the written word would not be so important. But if your conception of kingship is more than that, if you wish to make law, as Alfred did, if you wish to levy taxes, if you wish to uh, put wider burdens on your subjects, then literacy is crucial. You must correct the language, otherwise your purposes are mistook and justice goes astray. This systematic program was an act of faith on the part of a practical, resolute and ruthless man. But the vision goes beyond that. A vision which, at this time, could plan not merely for defence, but to make people's lives richer and fuller. And that is what makes this book one of our greatest treasures. We're now coming to understand more about Alfred not merely as a warrior, but as a far-sighted man capable of carrying out long-term administrative reforms of the widest implication. He had come a long way from the neurotic and impulsive youth of Ashdown, through the fire of Chippenham, Athelney and Eddington, to the peace of Wedmore and the triumph of London. He did more than grow up. He saved the essential Englishness of our culture and language. No epitaph on his achievement is better than his own. What I set out to do was to virtuously and justly administer the authority given me. I desired the exercise of power so that my talents and my power might not be forgotten. But every natural gift and every capacity in us soon grows old and is forgotten if wisdom is not in it. Without wisdom, no faculty can be fully brought out, for anything done unwisely cannot be accounted as skill. To be brief, I may say it has always been my wish to live honourably and after my death to leave to those who come after me my memory in good works.